Tonight's program um, is a really interesting one and it turns out to be more timely than we thought when we first scheduled it. The focus is on social media. Um, and as you probably know, the social media we use, many of us use, is a wonderful tool to enrich our lives, to provide us with information and connections. Um, and it's also a wonderful rich source of data that can be used in a variety of ways, um, that can be helpful to the community, not just to ourselves. The challenge, though, is balancing some of what we might learn from that data with our individual expectations of privacy and security. So knowing that, our speaker tonight has been working at a really interesting intersection of social media and public health and geography. And specifically, um, Dr. Tso, who is here from San Diego State University, um, has been working, he's in the geography department, which we might hear more about. Uh, as an, usually you don't think of social media and public health as in geography, but apparently this is a dimension of geography that's quite often used. And so he's a leader in working in this topic and is gonna share with us some of the science and technology behind this tonight, and then we'll have a conversation about some of the ethical issues. So join me in welcoming Dr. Tso. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this, this is really my great pleasure to come here today to share some of my research with you. So I'm a geographer, but I work with, collaborate with a lot of uh, different discipline people from the public health, civil engineering, communication, sociologies. Yeah, so I think today, because the recent coronavirus outbreaks, uh, so I like to pay more attention in today's topic, talk about the disease outbreak monitoring, and also some ethic issue relate to those, those uh, situations. So first of all, I want to introduce our Center for Human Dynamic in the Mobile Age at San Diego State University. We're building this center about four, like uh, six years ago. The idea for this center is we want to create, we call it transdisciplinary collaboration. Because traditional research are em emphasized on the silo in the individual department. But a lot of today's challenge, we need to collaborate across the different discipline. So in our center, we are including the faculty from the public health, geography, computer science, communications, also sociology department together. And then so working, focus on the big data, social media analytics to resolve the real world problem, such as disease outbreaks, transportations, disaster evacuations. So those are our topic. We have several funded project with the National Science Foundation and National Institute of Health. Yeah, so those are the list of our faculty member and the graduate student in our centers. Yeah, so what exactly what we talk about the human dynamics. So I'll ask, ask you, how many of you has smartphone on your hand? Okay, everybody has that, right? So today is a, is a, is a product, everybody has that. But think about smartphone, is not available in the human history until 15 years ago. The first smartphone only revealed 2007. The whole human history, millions and millions of years, the, only the recently we can track an individual, their behavior, their communication, but not just one person. Hundreds, thousands, and millions of persons gathered together. So this dynamic, this, this new field called the human dynamic is a transdisciplinary research focused on the understanding and analyzing those patterns, relations, narrative, and transition for our activity, our behavior, and our communications. So I want to give you one example. This is a, a graphic created by one of my students. You see this is a downtown San Diego, right? And every single dot, the, there's a purple dot is a one person actually tweeted using the Twitter. How many of you have Twitter account? Yeah, some of you, but not very many people. But a lot of young generation has the Twitter account. But only if 1% people in San Diego has Twitter account, that creates this type of data. This is show you that every single hour, how many people tweet the message on the exact location in downtown. From the morning, from the afternoon, from the evening. You can see that in the midnight, not many people in there. But what information can you use for this type of data? We can use to track traffic congestion. We can use to predict the business sales. 
we can also use for disaster evacuations. And finally, for the disease outbreak, we can estimate how people move, how likely using the mathematical model to predict the disease spread. Yeah, so there's a lot of potential using this data collecting from your smartphone. So as I, I'm a geographer, so first thing I really want to emphasize is geography is very important. Yeah, geography is a key to understand the big data because geography deals with the space and time, location and time. Think about disease tracking, disease monitor. We need to know when the disease happened. That's the time. When the first case, second case, third case, also need to know the location of disease. In Hong Kong, in China, or in Taiwan, or in San Diego, in Seattle. So analyzing the data between the time and space place, that's the key to understand the disease outbreaks. Also, we'll use that to monitor, create a model, computational model, to simulate those disease spread. So today, I want to show you uh, one of my case. We have been conducting this for a few years, using the Twitter as a source to track in the disease, the flu outbreak in the US. So now, I want to show you a video. We are in the sneezy, achy, miserable heart of the flu season. So far, 20 people have died of the flu in San Diego County. But new at 7 o'clock, 10 News reporter Natasha Zuvez shows how one local researcher is using social media to save lives. <laughs> if you've ever tweeted about feeling under the weather in the last four years, chances are one man at SDSU has seen it. Ming Tso is using Twitter to track flu outbreaks in 31 major cities across the country with wild success. We can collect not just one or two people, but millions of people, or even billions together. Billions of messages, like this tweet. His technology often pulls out a location and will pinpoint words like sore throat and cold. When Twitter numbers are crunched and you compare them to doctors' submitted reports, they are startlingly accurate. And the Twitter data can identify flu outbreaks 10 days before the CDC report. I was a little bit shocked about how close we are. Well, we want to give you a look at Ming's real-time Twitter map. Take a look. In the last four months, San Diego has had more than 200 tweets about the flu. That's compared to Los Angeles that has more than 800 tweets. But how can this save lives? Well, Ming reports these patterns of an outbreak to the CDC, allowing them to funnel resources, vaccines, medications to the areas that will need it most. In Ming's research from 2012, after Superstorm Sandy hit, flu exploded on the East Coast and from there spread west. Using Twitter, they hypothesize it was the close quarters in the storm shelters that caused the outbreak. Sometimes those connections can even follow such things as airplane routes, uh, travel routes, job routes. Natasha Zuvest, 10 News. Ming's Twitter numbers on the flu are so instantaneous and accurate that the CDC requests his data every two weeks. So far here at home, his research shows there was a big flu spike around Christmas, but he expects the cases to remain high. Okay, so this was a show video, but I want to highlight with a few key things. First of all, we do collaborate with CDC back 2014. At that time, CDC actually, traditional CDC has a special unit to track in all the flu season in U.S. Yeah, but they also explore some potential using other type of source. So in 2014, they invite nine national teams, including San Diego State, to enter this called the Grand Challenge for the flu outbreak prediction. So we work together for the 13 weeks to submit our data and analyzing the, the group. Yeah, so it is pretty amazing to see. So among these nine teams, there's a five teams using the social media data, including Twitter. There's a four using the Google flu trend, like a keywords, and there's a two using the Wikipedia. Like how many people are open to modify the content. So I think that's a very, there's a one paper I was available, yeah. So our case study, we collecting 31 city using the geographic geotech location. So not collecting everything in US, but we can, the idea is we want to track individual city with a different outbreak, because different city will have different pattern. And we also apply for the machine learning, the AI algorithm with a linguistic like a, approach yeah, to analyzing our data. And then finally, we represent that into the visualization format that we call the smart dashboard. So here's a one, the first year our outcomes. So you can see that 
the the purple line here is yeah the purple line here is our uh, prediction using the flu the Twitter data the the red line is the CDC official data called IOI influenza like illness so they are very close that like related the, re the correlation is 0.84 which is a pretty good yeah from the flu outbreak prediction yeah so I think we have the first year do the good job right so how about second year the second year we have the oh the in addition to the national level, the first year we also do the San Diego level. So actually we collaborate with San Diego County Health, uh, Health and Human Services Agency with their epidemiology department. So they do announce those San Diego County flu watch weekly. They have a record for every single confirmed case from the lab result in San Diego County. And when we compare with our Twitter data, the correlation even higher is a 0.9233. So that's a very impressive number. So I think first year we think, oh, we did a good job, right? But second year, we have a big problem because Twitter, the data we get from the company, they change their API. So the API is called a, a mechanism we can automatically to feed the data from their server. So if the company change the API, API, we're losing our data. So that the second year, 2014, we lose almost 90% of our data. So originally we can get 1,000 tweets per day. In the 1914, we can only get 100 tweets per day. Yeah. So the data reduced. So then we have a big problem, right? Anyone can guess what's the result we predict that year? Actually, even better. <laughs> <laughs> so we, in that year, we only using geotech data from the tweets, only 4% compared to the original one. But the result is not bad. Why? Because when we talk about the big data analytics, the more important is the how representative those data represent our general public. So traditional Twitter versus geotech Twitter, even the number is smaller, but actually that geotech trade is more representative, then result could be more correlated. <coughs> so size doesn't matter. It's really the pattern or the, your representation matters. Yeah. So this is a not bad, right? What about the next year? We actually created another analysis on 2015, but the result is terrible. The number has dropped to like a 0.5 something. So we can compare these two lines. The gray line is 2014 season. You see the peak in 2014. So in 2014, we have a very severe flu season. That means the signal is very strong. So when we analyze it using the human sensing kind of a social media, the result is very good. But 2015, we don't have flu season. We don't have flu season. You can see that in the, around the Christmas time, there's no peak at all. Only the mild peak after the January and February. So low season, low flu season, no signal, our prediction, very bad. So prediction is actually related to the significance of the flu outbreaks. The more strong outbreak, the more better prediction you are. But also we found that there's an interesting fact is on the week 16, around the end of February or early March, there's a high peak we find out in our data, Twitter data. Anyone can guess what happened for that week? There's a lot of people talk about the flu, but it's not about the flu like a disease. Anyone can guess? It's about the prince. That year, prince died. In the, the first few days, people suspect he got the flu, and that's the cause of the reason. So people tweet about that. But why our machine learning didn't pick, a, pick that as an error? Because every time when we do the machine learning, we have to manually label those numbers, those tweets, text. In this case, we didn't label it in our original database, or original training set. So that's created a problem. So that also tells us that in order to monitor those outbreak you need to modify, you need to change your algorithm for the machine learning every single year, but not maybe, not maybe every single month. So you cannot just use the single algorithm, single AI to do everything. Human beings are very complicated. Every year, there's a new meaning of a keyword. There's a new meaning of a, like a, like a statement. It will trigger or impact your analysis. Yeah, so that's one thing we also learned. So in addition to the Twitter social media, there's other research team 
analyzing the disease outbreak, like this one is a, one of my favorite from the Boston Children's Hospital, Dr. John Bronston. He's a well known to create this one called the healthmap.org. So they analyzing the disease outbreak by collecting those local news channels and also self-report cases. So they have an engines collecting everybody's news. So there's also another company in Canada they call the Blue Dot, also using a similar idea to collect in the foreign language news and also animal disease networks. Yeah, so some article, like recent article they mentioned in the, the Wild magazine say they actually can predict the coronavirus outbreak a few weeks ahead of the Chinese government. Yeah, so that, I don't know for sure, but there's some report for that. Yeah, so my question is, can we really predict in those outbreaks? in the case, current case of COVID-19. But we want to predict what we need to know when the starting point outbreak, what is the peak time, what is the scale and the impact to our society, and when it will be over. So as I mentioned, I'm a geographer. One of my focus is mapping. So how the first thing to understand the outbreak is to map. So this is a one very interesting map to create by the John Hopkins Public Health Department. Yeah, they're using the software we call the Geographical Information System to display the disease outbreak. You can see I'm tracking here from the, this is the first week of the, the database. Yeah, first week has only happened in China, mostly is Wuhan, but the second week, third week, and today. So today you can see the disease actually is already spread out from the China center disease to the global outbreak. I would say the global pandemic is happening right now. Yeah, so I have to be, we have to be careful. On the other hand, the U.S. is still okay, but it could change dramatically in the next few weeks. So I have, everybody had to be very careful. But think about, is this the first time we have this type of outbreak? No, actually, 10 years ago, we, we do have this one called the H1N1. Okay, that some people call the swine flu. This is the maps at that time, after the few weeks. So you can see this global thing. The United States actually has a lot of cases for H1N1. Today, H1N1 still exists, but we put H1N1 as a part of our flu season. But, but the coronavirus is different. I have to say that it's totally different than flu outbreak, so we have to be very, very careful. Yeah, so I want to, but just from the mapping perspective, you can see some similarity and differences. Yeah, so we actually can using a lot of different platforms to de detecting our, our disease outbreak. Social media is one, local news channels, but also everybody, when you see the doctor, you have your electronic medical record. Every hospital, every clinic has those diagnosed records. Combined then, if we have a real-time analysis, that also can be used a good prediction power. Yeah, other commercial data, when you shopping, when you go to the right A to buy a, a flu medicine, that record actually can be used to predict the flu outbreaks. Yeah, because that usually you will not see doctor immediately, right? The first thing you have a flu symptom, go to the right A or the some drugstore to buy some medicine. So that type of data also be very usable. Your transaction, when you do the credit card transaction, like in China, when they want to predict in the, the coronavirus break, they're actually using a Chinese version of a Apple Pay to monitor the, the people or transaction moving between Wuhan city and other cities. Yeah, so there's a lot of other things. Yeah, some people also did a, even do the water sampling from the sewage system to see the drug abuse situation. And then also a lot of people doing the survey, online survey or human survey. But those things are very expensive. The most cheaper, inexpensive, and the real-time data probably is social media. So is that the, the promising direction? Well, it depends. We still have a, some problem. As the biggest problem, when we are detecting the disease, if the disease is known, like flu, we did a good job. If the disease like uh, COVID-19 or SARS is challenging because we don't know the name of disease. We can, don't know how to track them. So another potential is we're using the syndromatic surveillance. We'd rather to track in the disease name, we're tracking the syndrome. Your fever, coughing, headache, short bracing, like uh, vomiting, yeah. But those things 
we, this is a, the screenshot we did a like five or six years ago. We tried to do that direction, but our result is not very good because the noise is too much. Yeah, there are too many noise. A single keyword fever can mean anything, right? Yeah, you can, when you go to the, some passion is a fever. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of problem, but there's a p potential. We could develop a more advanced machine learning to filter out those noise. So we are still working on that direction. So hopefully it could be a good another direction. Yeah, but also there's other problem for using the social media. First of all, most of the social media is the young generation using. So although the senior people, citizen, do using social media somehow, like our president, yeah, he's a favorite using the Twitter, but majority is still young. So when the disease outbreak happened, if the disease is focused on attacking the elder people, those symptoms will not be reflecting on the social media quickly. Yeah. If the disease is attacking young group, then it will be catching up the signal very quickly. So that is a minor problem. Yeah, so that's one problem. Another one is the robot and also fake news and noise. So when you interact with the social media, media like Twitter, actually there's more than 30% of a Twitter account are fake or we call the robot, it's not human being. Yeah, so you may not be aware that you are interact with uh, following someone who is uh, just a robot, automatic generate the information. And those things could be the problem because uh, those fake news, it could trigger a lot of uh, controversial issues. I will talk about in a few slides. So another problem is uh, in the social media, there's an imbalance about how many user and how many voice. So usually only 1% of a social media user is very active. Those messages is actually including 1% user generate 16% of a message. 10% user generate 80% of message. So it's really, you can see the diagram, diagram here. Yeah, the first one is the people only tweet once per month. That's majority, yeah, I have a Twitter account. I only tweet once per month. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, but how many people tweet zero? Actually, it's maybe ten times of this number. So majority of the social media user is silent. But the, when we collecting that, sometimes we only listen to those chatter. Those people are we very active. Yeah. So we have to be careful about the balance of the, those things. And finally, we want to focus on the talk about the fake news and echo echo chamber. There's a big problem. Yeah, in the social media, because it was very effective way to disseminate the information. But the, if the information is fake news, it was jeopardizing a lot of things. And what the reason, like one of the study we analyzing is using the vaccine topics. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, social media discuss whether it's the anti-vaccine or pro-vaccine group. So pro-vaccine is more scientific community. You can see the construction of uh, the social network is very scattered. As everybody has individual network, it's not like a coherent. Yeah, so information for that type of the network, easy to disseminate or distribute to every different location. But on the other hand, the anti-vaccine group is very coherent, only have a very few, we call the opinion leader. And information is only tracking inside the group. So that's created, we call the echo chamber. So those type of echo chamber network, you cannot allow other voice the same wrong information, fake news, were always like, talking each other inside the channel. Yeah, so this is the problem, yeah, also the, the danger for the social media. Yeah. So for the fake news and then those robots, it will create a problem to prevent the effective communication, will also reduce the trust for our government agency, and also will fragment our society. So there's a lot of a problem. So, how can we identify the fake news? How can we identify the robots, those bots? Yeah, there's some researchers are doing some prototyping, so hopefully in the future, yeah, when you interact with the social media, you will have some index or matrix which tell you this person, how likely this person is a robot or not. Yeah, hopefully that, that is ongoing. So I want to give you an example. Sometimes the fake news is good or bad. So I was, Watching my Twitter a few days ago, I saw this news from our U.S. Surgeon General. So this is not fake news, right? But actually it has some wrong information. So our U.S. Surgeon General said, serious people, stop buying masks. I agree with that. 
they are not effective in preventing general public from catching the coronavirus. But if the healthcare provider can get them, I put them in our community risk. So there's a choose part is we had to like, uh, make sure our health provider get the mask they need, otherwise we jeopardize. But they also, in the, this message, say masks are not effective preventing public from catching the virus. Is that true? Well, the idea is so people feel comfortable not buying the mask, right? right? But the, the truth is, because I'm original from Taiwan, so I watch a lot of the news in Taiwan. Taiwan facing this epidemic one month before US. So the government actually has responded a lot of different compared to the US government. So sometimes, this is actually more information I get from the internet. So masks actually help, it do help. But there's a civil mask, like N95, or the surgical mask is the most effective way to block in the virus. But other masks is not effective. So does that mean you should only buy this N95 and the surgical mask? Well, actually it's not. After a few weeks, the Taiwan government say, actually all masks help, even those low, low quality ones. Why? Because the mask is not to block in the virus. The mask is protecting yourself from your hand to your mouth. Well, that's the biggest situation, yeah. If you don't wear a mask, when you put, touch something, you're easy to touch your, your nose or your hand. When you wear a mask, your behavior to danger yourself will reduce significant. So it doesn't matter what kind of a mask you are. As long as you have a mask, you are protecting, you are preventing the danger behavior. So any mask help. Yeah, but that information, I couldn't see that in, in US at this point, but that information has been announced in Taiwan, in Singapore, and a lot of uh, Asian countries. Yeah, so in Taiwan, actually CDC suggests, when did you need to wear a mask? You need to visit a hospital or clinic, or you take public transportation, bus or train. Yeah, so also you are, you, you are sick. So there are different policies right now from the Asian country and the US. Yeah, so I think there's a inconsistent. We have to be careful about that. Also. There's a key issue is about the locational privacy. We know that we worry about the virus, the coronavirus. Also, especially those confirmed cases. But should we reveal the location of those confirmed cases, their residential, lo residential location? Yes or no? Well, on the transparent side, we need to reveal that where like, they've been visited. Maybe they visit like a sea world or they visit like a Disney Island, then people will be more cautious, right, about those locations. But on the other hand, it will also put the people say, oh, if I didn't visit those areas, I can visit Legoland, it's safer. But no, Legoland is not safer, so that creates a problem. So actually, there's an interesting, this map is show you the in Singapore, they actually decide to reveal every single confirmed case, their resident location in Singapore. But in Taiwan, the government said, no, we are blocking that information. We are not showing because it created hassle, or created danger or panic in the local community. So which one is correct? Which one should we do? Yeah, so I think we can discuss that later on. But I think the final message I also want to do is a stigma situation. I think this is the most dangerous situation when we have a disease outbreak for our society. It's not just because stigma or discrimination is bad, but also it will trigger the bad impact for the, the, the disease outbreak, the fighting the disease. Why? If you stigma the, those patients yeah, who get infected, so what you do? If you think, maybe I got a virus, I got this coronavirus, will you report yourself to the doctor? Will you report yourself to the health agency? You will not if we stigma that. Because I would say, if I tell the doctor, my whole family will be ashamed and then I, I will lose my job or something, then you will hide it. So if we stigma that, there's hundreds of people who maybe get infected, will hide it, and they will create a bigger problem to spread out the disease. So we should not stigma that, those diseases. We need to protect him to make even some compensation. You know, in Taiwan, the people who get confirmed or isolated quarantine, the government actually pay money to them to cover their loss of their homeworks. Yeah. So that's, in, that's the final message I want to highlight. So that will probably end my talk today. And thank you. 
we will be taking some of your questions in a moment, but I, there's a couple things I thought might be useful to start off with. One is just sort of infrastructure. I found it really interesting when I heard about this idea of this kind of work in the Department of Geography. We spoke about this briefly beforehand, and it, it occurred to me as we talked that this is something worth commenting on, the need to break down barriers between what are really pretty artificial structures of saying, here's the Department of X, there's the Department of Y, because you're working at the intersection of at least a couple of different fields. Do you have any thoughts on the need to think of science in a more multidisciplinary way instead of? Yeah, I think this actually is a trending situation in all over the world. In the National Science Foundation, in the National Institute of Health, all the major project, the large project, had to be transdisciplinary. So there's a requirement, say, if you submit a proposal, you have to at least include in the three or four different departments to submit a research proposal. Why we need that? Because a lot of today's challenge, the research challenge, is do need a different perspective, work together, and we call the team science. Yeah, so we're using those um, different collaboration among departments will create a synergy to innovative idea, innovative answer by using those collaborations. Yeah. Yeah, so that that sounds like a really I mean it sounds like where the good science will come from. Yes. But it's it means that we should be evolving towards a world where we don't worry about which department you're in, more about what kind of work do you do. Um, so then a second sort of infrastructure question that I don't think I heard you talk about that would be useful to, to note. You're collecting data from human beings. Um, so what sort of responsibilities do you have? What does it look like for getting review and approval for doing this work? Do you just do this, nobody's watching, or is somebody watching? <laughs> well, this is a great question. Actually, we do think about this question when we first time to collect in the Twitter data. Yeah, we think Twitter data is from human being, right? And then we submit IRB to our university, the committee, and guess what? What's our response? Twitter data is not human data. So we actually are exempt from the IRB because we're collecting data from the third company. The data is from the company. And this not only happened to our university, every researcher in US they, on the Twitter or the social media, they got the same answer from the IRB. So I think that is a problem. I think traditional, our law, our regulation for the IRB, like, I is not intend to those, those social media data. So our law is behind that. Yeah, so, so we have to be more educated to our legislation. So what, at the same time, although we are exempt from the IRB, but we have to still be very careful because the data we're collecting, it could contain a lot of uh, sensitive information. That because those users, the Twitter user, they don't know that their data were collecting publicly. They think they just talk to their friend, mm -hmm. but they actually they don't know that their tweet can see by everybody in the whole world. Yeah, so that's a different like a conceptual situation, and we do collecting a lot of uh, sensitive data when we talk collecting the drug abuse, marijuana. We can even see the information people are selling drugs online using the Twitter. Yeah, so those are lot of things. We have to be, I think law is behind. We have to move in a little bit forward to catch up the new trend. Yeah, so, so if, for those who aren't familiar with the IRB process, this is what universities, research institutions use for research with human subjects. An institutional review board, IRB, looks at the research that involves human subjects. Are you open to the idea of maybe you're the community of people who study at least Twitter accounts and maybe more generally social media, um, perhaps creating its own body to try and review each other's research, it's separate from IRBs? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think also I want to follow about, about the, the whether it's a, we need to be concerned or not. I think I want to give an example. Let's say Google Street Map, right? Anyone use the Google Street Maps? And then there's a street view that Google can take picture on the street. Was that violated by privacy situation or not? If you have your own camera, can you take everybody picture on the street? Well, actually, yes and no. Sometimes, so I think the law in general defines that if you have a specific target, I want to tracing 
my favorite style is the Taylor Swift, right? Okay. So I want to follow stalking Taylor Swift using the photo, even on a public land, taking that picture, that's illegal. If I don't have an intention to target any specific person, I just want to take a pen, pen view, that's okay. So send as a Twitter data. If we using Twitter data as a keyword to analyze the general public in general, I think that should be okay. But if we using Twitter data to search for specific person, search for their behavior, search for their in individual tracking, that could be problematic. Yeah, so it really depends on the motivation and also how the, the target of your subjects. Yeah, so I think that could be the potential direction for the, for the policy. Yeah. yeah, good. So um, we have a few questions here. Um, I'm gonna start with, this one is um, sort of broadens what you might look at. The, the question is why analyze just Twitter and not more widely used social media platforms like Facebook? And I'll just comment that I've learned over the last few years that different groups, different demographics use different platforms. So um, it might be that this audience, for example, uses Facebook more often. I don't use either, but. Uh, yeah. so. <laughs> this is a great question. Also, I've, I've been asking a lot. The answer is uh, the company. Facebook is a closed company. Facebook don't share their data. They don't provide the API for the researcher to collecting. Because I think they, sometimes they try to open a little bit door, but uh, there's a bad event happen and right. damage their reputation. So they shut down the door. So right now for the researcher, you can only go to their headquarters inside their lab, take a look at the data, but you cannot do any analysis or bring the data back. Mm -hmm. So Facebook is very like a protective their data. On the other hand, Twitter is more open. We can get a free API, free data collection, even though the data we're collecting, only 10% of the data. If you want to get 100% data from Twitter, you need to buy it. It's very expensive, very, very expensive. So, and also I have to say that does the information you post on the, your Facebook and Twitter is belong to you? No, they belong to the company. So you are the product of those Facebooks, those Twitter. So when we're collecting the data, we cannot share or resell the data. That's also the problem for scientific research because we want to, when we have a journal publication, the journal say, you need to sharing, open your data, but because the license with the Twitter API, we cannot share the original data of Twitter. We can only share the summarizing result. Yeah, so there's a lot of a problem is to, because the private company, like a Facebook, like a Twitter, they control the data. Yeah, that, I hadn't realized that distinction, which you can only study what you can study. Yes. Um, and that leads to a deeper question, at least for me, is um, that if you have particular demographics that are the ones that you're studying and you're trying to make predictions based on that, that you might be unintentionally biasing decisions. So for example, you were saying this technology could be, this approach could be used to figure out where to target resources in the case of, of an outbreak but you're actually choosing to target communities that happen to be overrepresented with people who are using the particular platform. Are there ways to correct for that? Or what, what, it, what, what do we? Yeah, I think there's a several way we can do the resample of the data. I think the, even though the, the, like for example, in the social media, Twitter, the senior people, the percentage is small, but they are still large number in terms, because. Uh, our base is large. So it still have like a one or two million senior citizens using the Twitter every day. Yeah. So the key is if we want to combine the combination of the keyword, we can find out what is the most common keyword used by the senior citizen. Maybe there are more folks on the retirement fund or the like insurance. So we're using those keywords. Every keyword have a different profile for the user group. So we combine with different keywords, we may be able to retrieve, resample the data, that like this group data is most of a, like a younger, but within that there's a still senior. We use another way to resample data to retrieve the most senior people from the group. So that like sub-sampling, that could be one solution to do the specializing analysis. Yeah, yeah so I mean, you, you referenced this earlier also, that, there, that, that, that different words might be used in different ways and that they also might be moving targets because yes. 
the language, the vocabulary evolves. So in that environment, I, I'm picturing the need to constantly be tweaking the algorithms. And the question is, um, do you have any way to estimate how far behind the curve you're going to be because you have to, I mean, how much time does it take to figure out what the right vocabulary is? And by that time, have things changed? Yeah, I think that's exactly the challenge we are facing from the academic perspective. Yeah, so choosing the right keyword, modify, and then, but I think every scenario, every situation have a, the time, like a lifespan. Yeah, so some, like for example, we are analyzing the wildfire situation. The wildfire is happened only like a two or three weeks. If we're emphasizing the like a disease outbreak, like a flu, we have to track in the whole season. So every different scenario, different situation will have their signature. Yeah. So maybe we we'll, can based on the signature decide how often we need to tweak or modify our algorithm. So it's really case by case. Also, different city, different culture will have a different way to monitor their, their situation, yeah. So um, I'm turning to a, another question. Um, this person is reflecting on um, the idea if you want to know what's going on in the battlefield, um, you should be asking the privates, corporals, and sergeants, not the colonels and generals. Um, and I think for that reason, they, they like this idea of going to the Twitter feed. You're getting people on the ground. Um, but they also recognize, uh, based on their question, that the information is imperfect. There's different degrees and in, in sense to which it's not accurate. So they're asking you, how should officials use uh, big data, such as this, and AI, if they are aware that they may not be using accurate data? So I think that reflects, you have to reflect on, so how accurate does it have to be to decide to use it? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that's also a great question. I think we always try to make a, a rising for our society. But sometimes those results or the analytic could be misused or misunderstood. So we have to be very careful about these things. And then uh, I think the first thing I would do is uh, some sensitive situation, we need to communicate with the authority. Yeah, we cannot just do our own things. For example, when we're analyzing the disease outbreak, we need to also talk to the the county level of uh, epidemiology, epidemiology department, talk to CDC and sharing the information. Yeah, sometimes our prediction could have a strong potential crisis or panic. We have to be careful. Yeah, the same thing will, because one of my, another side of my research is for the disaster response. When we have wildfire, when we have hurricanes, how do we analyze in the media, the social media respond to the, the people who may be stuck in the, their house and they need help. So there's those things, but one danger for that is the, uh, especially in U.S. because we have official 911 channel, so the government agency will prefer you call 911 rather than tweet about your 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 crisis, okay? Because they are not responsible for your tweet, but they are responsible for the, your 911 call. However, if the crisis scale up. If there's a 1,000 one-man code, the authority will not handle. At that time, your tweeting on social media could be your potential to get help, yeah, but it's not guaranteed. So in US, when, when I talk to our county office emergency services, they always had struggle with that one. So using social media to, to detect the general trending, general policy is fine. If you want using social media to detect an individual user who need help, that could be problematic, but also could be very useful. I think a few years ago, there's a, a Hurricane Katrina, I think in, in those area, they actually, there's a volunteer group. Those volunteer group, they volunteer to create a community to monitor the social media message who need for help. And they send their, their, their boat to actually to the location to pick up people. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a term like a, some kind of a Navy like a association. So that could be, social media can be worked with a nonprofit organization for the volunteer group. And non-official non one, they can work together. That could be a potential, yeah. Yeah, so in terms of um, information people can use, um, I think what you're suggesting though is that if you are in the midst of one of those situations, dial 911, tweet, 
Maybe turn to your Facebook account just in case. Um, anything you can think of to get the word out. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is a, the, the next question is one that um, I think has cut across a number of, of programs where we are interested in something that as a society we can benefit from, but in order to get the data, individuals have to give up something, they, in this case, their privacy. I mean, in a good, a very different example might be doing cancer research. So if somebody has cancer, they participate in studies, the community can benefit. Some people have even gone so far as to argue in that case that we should expect people who are benefiting from historical cancer research to be willing to participate in research now as somebody who is dealing with cancer. And you could argue similarly as this person's asking, should all of us allow tracking of our personal data to help in making data more valid? In other words, to make this better. Should we just accept that this is a trade-off we should have? Well, I, I would say this is another great question. We are, this is also a dilemma we are facing today is uh, the more information we get, the more useful we can do the analytics, but the more privacy uh, intrusion will happen to those records. Especially when I do a lot of uh, cancer research, we always want to aggregate the data into like a more non dis we call de identification procedure. So I think ideally in the future we could develop the algorithm to original data collection could be very detailed, but we have an algorithm to de identify those sensitive information and we can aggregate we call the synthesis data. So there are some research that say we are way to massage our data, it's making the data still useful, but it's de-identifiable. Yeah, so that is the, there's a sound statistic algorithm are working on that direction. Yeah, but I think in general it's still a big challenge for us. So it's always the dilemma to, ba to balance. But I think every situation will have a different priority. So some situation happen, people will change the attitude for the privacy. So I think we really depend on the, every, I think I would say the citizen is smart enough to make the right decision. So the best way is I would prefer not decide by the government agency or the top leader is decide by the general public. You decide what kind of information you want to reveal or not. Okay, well since you've proposed that, let, uh, let, can we follow through how that would work? So. Um, should everybody who has a Twitter account be given an opt-in, opt-out option? So, and so then your data would be drastically reduced because a lot of people would fail to opt-in. Or would they have to opt-out? In other words, you have to choose to not be involved and so you're automatically in if you... So in, any preference on that? <laughs> well, actually that situation happened in Twitter. Yeah, I know that I mentioned there's a 1% of the Twitter user they usually turn on your GPA tracker to track the location. That is a, that is a volunteer, voluntary behavior, this option. But I think last year or two years ago, Twitter actually removed that action. So people will not have option to up in, they always up out. Okay. okay, so I think that can kind of relieve the few things. But that also caused a problem. Our data collection for the geotech is <coughs> reduced about like 60%. So we are losing our data. Yeah, but I think that's good for the community, but there's some situation you, you can still reveal your location by checking. There's a function called the check-in. You can check into free science center or check into the senior state, then that will have a mark. Yeah. So there's a different way to, to manipulate our data. I think give the option to the, the user, I, I, I still think that's a good thing to do. And then even the data may be not good enough, but I think in the long run, enough people we still can make some interesting analysis. Yeah. Yes, cool. So, um, this next question is about um, sort of operationally how you use your data. Um, they said, should data generated by social media always be complemented by other direct science generated data? I think what they're saying basically is independent information. Um, and I, everything I've heard from you is just that you'd say yes, but I don't know whether you want to reflect on that a bit more. Do you need anything else besides your data? <laughs> I would say social media is just part of the mainstream information. Yeah, sometimes they're very useful, but I would say it will never 
become the only information source for the decision making. Yeah, for the disease outbreak, I would say the majority, like the CDC, they will, the major information is from the official channel, from the hospital, the clinic, but the social media can provide the insight, provide additional information. So I think when we do those analysis, I have to be careful, like even for the disaster response, the same thing. I think social media has the value, but it's not the only source. It's very dangerous to say only, we got only decision based on only on the social media because it could have a lot of a problem. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to another question that um, gets to how, the specifics of how you recognize a particular uh, the, the characteristics of a particular disease. So you've talked about using this technology for looking at H1N1, for looking at influenza uh, uh, generally, f and for looking at COVID-19. So what can you say about how you would distinguish those three, and can you? Yeah, I think one thing is the, every different disease has different symptom, right? So as far as I know, the, the new COVID-19 they will have a fever, they will have a coughing, but there were not many like a symptom for like a, like a muscle ache or something, although there's a small percentage. So every, so I think if we're using the syndrome base to differentiate the, the pattern, we may be able to differentiate the pattern between the flu and the COVID-19s, yeah. And also about the, I would say the, the, the spreading like a pattern, yeah. Also, I think we can also track in if we. But the the problem is, when the new disease, unknown disease starting, we have no idea what their major symptoms are. We don't know because the COVID nineteen has been happening for almost two months. So now we know this is a like a majority pat the like symptom will do. Then we can track it. But when it's just starting, have no idea, and then there's no way to to differentiate this one with the other disease. So I think the more knowledge we accumulate about the understanding of the disease, the more possibility we can track in them more effectively. Yeah. yeah, so based on what we know now though, if I, I'm just trying to figure out what this looks like in practice. So um, if you wanted to know if, if an outbreak of the flu or COVID-19 was in process, you would ask the question, are we seeing people talking about muscle aches a lot? If you are, then that might be the flu, and if you aren't, it might be COVID-19. But if they were both going on at the same time, you would perhaps miss it as a COVID-19? Is that the fear here? Or? Yeah, I think that that's a good question. I think a single keyword may be not that representable, but combine, combine the pattern, mm -hmm. I would say percentage. Maybe there's a 8% people mentioned the, the muscle ache, maybe 80% people mentioned about the coughing. So we were analyzing those, we call the like a aggregates, like analysis. And with the pattern, I think the good thing is that those complicated patterns, actually machine learning can help us detecting those different patterns. So I would imagine in the future, you could be developed some pattern. Recognizing we can not, only, not just use single keyword, using 100 different symptom keyword and see the trend and the pattern and compared to different disease, then we may be able to differentiate those different yeah, by using the machine learning and the hundreds of keywords. Um, this causes me to wonder whether you have an opinion or in whether you believe your opinion is informed about whether there is value in closing borders at all for this or, I mean, what, what do your data and what does your approach tell you about whether that's something that's useful to do? Well. I want to find the, the spatial temporal modeling perspective, maybe not from social media, because I'm a geographer, so we do a lot of what we call the space-time model, modeling how the people are tra traveling, how the, the, the good of product is, is diffusing, but the disease is also, human being is the vector. We carry the disease. So any movement between a human being, between a city, between country, will create the potential of a disease outbreak. So if you block in that source, that is still the most effective way to block in the disease. Yeah, so from political perspective, the blocking border maybe sounds scary, but from the public health epidemiology perspective, blocking the P 
people transaction is probably the very effective way. Yeah, even though it's against our nature, but in disease outbreak perspective, human movement, that's still very effective. I think, in, for example, in Taiwan, Singapore, in Taiwan, actually the government blocking, maybe not blocking the, everybody, but anyone who are from the China, if you, the citizen of China, they cannot go to Taiwan right now. But if the Taiwan people in China, they can come back. So every time when they come back, they have to quarantine for two weeks. Everybody from China have to quarantine for two weeks. So that way, that's the procedure we, they have implemented in Taiwan or Singapore. So I think not just shut down the border completely, but there were different procedure to prevent the communication between the human being. That is effective. Okay, well, and just to be clear, I, I, I see the principle, but I mean, I'm wondering whether once cases are present in a country, and if you're defining borders only as by country rather than by city, um, is it just a matter of time then before it spreads? Because it seems like, you know, then closing the border is too late. It's well, it's, I would say not closing the border. Uh, well, it really depends on the, the infection, like uh, how many percentage of people will carry the disease yeah, to diffuse. Yeah, so, I, I mean, it could be like uh, the early time, I would say it's not closing the border, but use a different way to control the people movement. So you can come to the, come to the cross the border, but once you cross the border, you have to quarantine for two weeks before you can freely move on. That is durable. But if you're just blocking, why? I think the harsh blocking will create a problem. Why? When you do the harsh blocking, people will transfer border privately from illegal channel. From illegal channel, then you have no idea to control that. And that illegal channel, smuggling, or it will create a bigger problem for disease outbreak. So put the border is open, but with certain type of control. I think that will be the best way to do. We have time for, I guess, one more question, brief question. Could you get the same results by tracking the sales of cold and flu tablets? Thank you. Yes, yes, there's already research doing tracking using, they're analyzing the Walmart and the Rite Aid, their sale record for the flu medicine, and they can actually tracking compared to flu season very, very good. Yeah, so there's already some research of that, but the problem is, some of the data are controlled by the, the vendors or some like a private industry. So you, in order to get those data expensive, sales data is also sometimes they're top secret, right? They want to compete with other company. So sometimes the data availability is a big problem. Yeah, but I do see a few research using those data and they are doing very good, yeah. Um, if, if it was required that those companies had to make that data available, would that be better than trying to figure things out from Twitter? Well, well it depends, because the sales, the sales information, it could be, has some complication, because for example, sometimes the, the flu medicine is a, can be converted to the drug or some people, so, so you may not detect in the flu outbreak, you may detect in illegal use of the flu medicine. You, uh, you may be detecting yeah. drug dealers and some yeah. drug, drug manufacturers. Well, so I think we probably should finish there to be ethically on time. Thank you very much for a really interesting Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you.